say that we, our program tonight is entitled American People's Organization and the Legacy of Malcolm X. We're very, very fortunate to have the chair of our national organization here to speak with us. He has some very, very good things to tell us about things that are going on across the country, the struggle for new African independence. But I'd like to begin by introducing what the New African Independence Movement is about, the New African People's Organization is about. First of all, it was founded in May of last year, May 19, 1984, the birthday of Brother Malcolm X. And the movement, the organization, developed from a history of struggle for land and independence inside the U.S. There are New Africans struggling from three different areas in this country, Detroit, Los Angeles, and New York City, who found that a lot of our work was very, very similar, and a lot of our ideology was similar so that we needed to begin to unite and do some co cohesive organizational work. To have this program this evening is part of New African History Month. And we say New African History Month because we represent, we see ourselves as being New Africans. Right. The struggle for land and independence, we understand, is a protracted one. So it's not something that in the month of February, at the end of this month, we're going to say, okay, now we're free and now we have our own nation. However, we can use this, the fact that there is a lot of media attention being drawn upon black history and begin to promote some of our ideas. So we see it more as black liberation month, a time to begin to talk about our liberation, the struggle for land and the struggle for independence. It's a chance for our, us to look at our history, our history as warriors on the continent of Africa, and also the struggle for freedom as a captive nation inside the United States. It's a, take, it's a chance for us to take time to remember that New African warriors are still struggling for land and independence. Right. Not only those of us that we see here, but the, through another movement. It's also time for us to begin to talk to our children and begin to see, make sure that our children understand that we are, there, we are more than just um, Michael Jackson or Prince. That we have more to our struggle than just those things. Right. Although we all appreciate music and we like music, we understand that our struggle has a history to it, a very rich history to it. And it's important that our children understand that. One of the things that are very, very, that's very, very sad to me is that a lot of our children in high school don't understand anything about our history. Because we grew up in the 60s, which many of us, which many of us were able to learn from. They know nothing of that. They know nothing of who Martin Luther King was, who Malcolm X was, and who these people actually struggled for. They have no understanding of why, you know, we're even talking about a history month, or what, what's the importance of it. The only time they ever talk about it is in February. So it's important for us, you know, make sure that our children participate not only in the month of February, but throughout the year. That's right. I think, <clears throat> as I said, the the title of our program is The Legacy of Malcolm X. And we have a speaker to actually deal with that issue, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time dealing with it. But I would like to read a quote that I think is very, very appropriate. And it was a quote from Malcolm X. And the quote is, you get your freedom by letting your enemy know that you'll do anything to get your freedom. All right, then on. you'll get it. It's the only way that you'll get it. And so we have to understand that. You know, we're not going to get our freedom by just going around begging for holidays. You know, um, well, last year I think there was a big movement to make Martin Luther King's birthday a holiday. We're not going to get our freedom doing that by going to D.C. and asking the white man to give us a holiday. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not going to get our freedom by begging for it. Jeez. The only way that we're going to be able to get our freedom is by taking it. Come and on. by understanding that that's the only way that we'll ever get our freedom. All right. All right. We say that the New African People's Organization is a part of the legacy of Malcolm X because we are talking also about freedom and land at any expense. Mm -hmm. All right. In studying some of the writings of Malcolm X, we understand that Malcolm X represented the correct ide ideology for organizing our people. He said that we have to put out examples for our people. Part of what we're doing here at the Center for Black Survival is to try and put examples for our people. You know, how we can begin to organize for ourselves, how we can actually unite together to do things for ourselves that will help benefit us as a nation of people, not only in this time when we're trying to survive, but also when we actually do have freedom. Malcolm X also believed that ultimately it would be the organized masses who would relentlessly fight for our freedom. And that's important. We understand that there are different levels. We have all different kinds of levels, different classes within our nation of people. But ultimately it's the masses who not only feel the brunt of imperialism or feel the brunt of unemployment to feel the brunt of hunger and no housing. So they will be the ones that will actually organize, will feel the need to go out and organize our masses and organize our people. 
I think at this point I would like to introduce, you know, our keynote speaker. Um, and I, maybe I should just say also what the nature of our program will be this evening. You know, we'll have a, a keynote speaker, Brother Chokwe Lumunga, will be speaking. We'll also have a slide pre presentation that will be on the New African People's Organization. Then we will take questions and answers, and then we'll close the program at that point. The slide presentation is first, I say. So I don't know who's introducing the slide presentation. Okay. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Brother Kamal Hassan, and we'll begin the slide presentation. There isn't a whole lot for me to say other than um, this is a slide presentation that illustrates some of the concerns of the New African People's Organization and some of our organizational thrusts. Okay putting out the kind of ideas that we want out about the New African People's Organization and about our struggle. I think, um, you know, the first time I'd ever seen it, I think it was an excellent job. Again, I think that um, one of the things that I, I thought about while watching it is that it's rare that we see these days people coming together and organizing or coming together in large groups for things other than concerts. And I think there's good examples that we saw in that where people can actually come together and organize. Those are like rallies. And, and things that people are going to do around particular issues. The next part of our program will be our keynote speaker, who is Brother Chokwe Lumumba. Brother Chokwe Lumumba is our national chair for the New African People's Organization and has a long history in the struggle for land and independence in this country. He's coming to us from Detroit, where he has done a lot of organizing, and I think that he can probably do a have a lot to tell us about the organizing he's done in Detroit, not only in Detroit, but across the country. Um, he's represented several of our Freedom Fighters. Um, I think he has a lot to say about that also. Um, I think the brother has a, um, a way of putting things out there. He's an attorney, and um, he has a way of putting things to us that makes us understand what our struggle is really about. Um, I don't think I've ever missed him coming when he comes to Los Angeles to hear him speak because he always has a way of really making things very clear in terms of what we are struggling about and what the struggle is, is for. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce him. Malcolm X died. 
Now we know, of course, that we don't come together to celebrate his death. What we come together to commemorate and to remember is Malcolm's life. Actually, if he life is the only thing that makes his death worth remembering. Mm -hmm. So you just can't die for the revolution. It's important to live for the revolution. That's right. That's right. And only if you live correctly for the revolution does it make sense to commemorate your death. Mm -hmm. right. And so we honor Malcolm because he lived for the revolution. He lived for the revolution. He lived and taught his people in the streets of Detroit and Harlem and Los Angeles and wherever he could go, he was dedicated to the uplifting of new African people in America. And so, we see Malcolm as kind of a prophet. Not a prophet in that he came from anywhere in the sky. All right, come on. Not a prophet in the sense that he was supernatural. <coughs> but a prophet in the sense that he spoke the truth. And speaking the truth made him a prophet. What he spoke was not the truth because he spoke it. But it was the truth, and he spoke it. And so as we talk about the legacy of Malcolm, it is important at this time for us to stop a while. Those of us who are involved in this movement and those of us who should be involved, because we all should. Those of us who are concerned with the daily struggle in our lives to raise our family, to live and to live free of bad housing, bad conditions, to get a job, that's a struggle for our people across this country today. It is important for us to sit back and look at this great man and say, what are some of the principles that Malcolm left us with? Malcolm left us with the principle of self-determination, self-development, self-help. He left us with the principle of self-defense. We in the New African People's Organization think all of these principles are very important. We know that self Health and self-development is important. You know it too. I mean, look around you today. We live in communities where we can't even own the stores that we have to go to the store to buy our food from. Right. Right. I mean, it's always been that way, it seems, with us here in America. Mm -hmm. The situation has been so-called integration that gave the excuse or the right for white people to come into our communities and to run our stores and to exploit us for all periods of time. When the regular white people got finished doing it, then they sent the Zionists in. That's right. And the Zionists came in our communities and exported our stores. Uh -huh. And now that the Zionists have gone to New Heights, they have stole Motown Record Company and stole a number of other things. That's right. They've controlled the booking industry and controlled the things that our kids read in the schools. Mm -hmm. Now we got new people who come in to export our stores. That's right. You go to New York, you see Koreans who run the stores in the black community. Mm -hmm. If you're in Chicago, you see Vietnamese who run the stores in the black community. If you're in Florida, you see Cubans, and if you walk out here, you see Asians and other people running the stores in the black community. That's right. Now, why is it that everybody runs the stores in the black community except the black community? In Detroit, you got Chaldeans, Christian, Christian Arabs. As rare as a Christian Arab is, you got <laughs> Christian Arabs running all the stores in the city of Detroit. These are people who the United States government have collaborated with in their own countries in order to try to overthrow the rightful government of those countries to steal the resources and rob the people blind. And when their own people have booted them out like the Vietnamese did, then the United States government, holding them a debt, gives them money to come over here to build stores in our neighborhood when we can't even build stores in our neighborhood. Right. And they tell you that the reason that you couldn't build the stores is because you couldn't talk good enough English. Right. 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 They say because you use too many debts and this and those and things like that. And you get people who come in here and don't even know how to speak English. And they're right. 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 So we know we need self-help, uh -huh. and we know we need self-development. That's right. And that's why we have these New African Scouts and that little bookstore. It's a little bitty bookstore right over there, but you can help make it big. That's why we have these institutions, which is necessary to begin to gather our thoughts so we can begin to develop ourselves. That's why we do this in the New African People's Organization across the country. We understand also that we need self-defense. Well, if we don't understand that now, we'll never understand it. If there was ever people who needed self-defense, we need self-defense. Whenever a gunslinger over on a suburb in New York can shoot two black youth in the back. Now, they tell you that these two black youth was trying to rob the sucker, right? But the reality is that they got shot in the back. 
In fact, one got shot in the back in the next subway car. So he had to run all the way from one subway car to the next subway car and shot the man in the back. Oh. They now tell us that there's no witnesses but him that can say that he was being robbed, right? And they also bring up witnesses who said that these young men had been on the bus or the train for a long period of time over there in New York in the Getz case. And that in that uh, subway, they had stayed there for a period of time and talked to many people, asked people for cigarettes and other things, but hadn't bothered anyone, right? And we know that this man is a white supremacist, a racist, that's made racist remarks before. That's right. And that after he had shot these young brothers, he said that he would have killed every one of them if he wouldn't have ran out of bullets. Mm -hmm. But what's so interesting about that is not only that he did it, but that it was so popularly accepted by white people across their country, and even by some handkerchief-head Negroes and other black people who are uninformed. We need self-defense. They're telling us today that we need self-defense because they believe they have the right to take our lives. That's right. Sixty percent of everybody killed by white police officers or police officers, period, in this country are black people. That's right. Fifty-four percent of people executed in history are black people. And we only constitute, they say, 14% of the population. In the city of New York, in the Eleanor Butler's case, just a little while ago, a white police officer with six of his buddies went into the woman's apartment in order to evict her because she hadn't paid the rent of the tenement, right? A 90 day, $90 for one month's rent, they were, came in there with guns to put her out of that apartment. And when she refused to leave, they shot her hand off, and then they shot her in the chest, and they killed her. And the police officer who did this was not indicted for monk, uh, for murder like he should have been. The guy's name was Sullivan, and he was only indicted for manslaughter, uh, a charge which he can get probation for. And then after he got indicted for manslaughter, the police got so mad that 10,000 of them took to the street to march, saying that he never should have been indicted in the first place. Armed with guns, 10,000 low-down, white, racist police marching in the streets of New York saying that they believe that he had the right to take Eleanor Bunker's life. Mm. So they're telling you, in popular ways, you saw what was happening there on those pictures that we were looking at, how when they burned the brother at the stake, it wasn't just one or two people out there. There were crowds of people out there. They publicized lynchings in the paper in history. They put them in a bulletin board so tens and sometimes fifteen thousands of people would come together. It's the same thing now. White people popularly support the notion that black people have got to die and that white people have the right to take their lives. Right. Now they have different notions nowadays. <clears throat> they used to tell us that the reason that they could take our life is because we were criminal, that we were uncivilized, we were savages. Right. And so we had to be Christianized. <clears throat> they had to brand us as they snatched us from Africa and then bring us over here and baptize us right after they branded us. This is what oh. they said was necessary <clears throat> in order to civilize us as a people. Well, that rationale won't do anymore. <coughs> you wouldn't go for it, and most of the people in the world won't go for it. Mm -hmm. And so what they've got is this new criminal rationalization. That's right. They have criminalized our people. Mm -hmm. They have for a long time criminalized our freedom fighters. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you fall in for it. That's, yeah, right. that's right. You remember the Brinks case, right? Mm -hmm. You remember the Brinks case? Mm -hmm. And so-called revolutionary and nationalists and other people walking around here talking and not doing very much. That's right. Walked around talking about the brothers in the Brinks case with nothing but petty criminals involved in petty crime. Mm -hmm. And you believe it. Some of you went for it, right? Mm -hmm. well, what were they doing trying to take the money from the Brinks truck? Well, if you would have listened close enough, the FBI would have told you that. Yeah. The money that was taken from these Brinks trucks went to Zimbabwe in order to finance the revolution that was going on by Zanu. Right. The money that was taken went to the middle of Harlem in order to build an acupuncture center, which right. treated 74 people a week, which couldn't be treated otherwise. Right. The money went to build little children's camps, and that's why they arrested Fulani Suni Ali with 200 troops down south, hmm. because some of the money went to help build her camp where she was raising children down there. Right. The money that they took was doing things that the United States government won't do. That's right. Doing things that Mayor Tom Bradley, the Uncle Tom Mayor of this city, won't do. That's right. That's right. Doing things that the UAW won't do. Mm -hmm. Doing things that white supremacists, so-called moderates and liberals like Walter Mondale won't do. That's right. And certainly doing things that Ronald Reagan will never do. Right. So this is what it was doing. And we call them criminals. You allow them to criminalize your freedom fighters and now they're criminalizing you. So if your children go on the subway, and if they ask somebody for something, or if they be a little rowdy, then they're crooks, and they can be shot down in the street. They're criminalizing a whole black community. And every same
single crime that black people are charged with, what they'll do is they'll put it in the paper. That's right. They they loved it when Wayne Williams was arrested and convicted oh, down there in that right? silly city yeah. of Atlanta yeah. on that charge. They loved it. And all those handkerchief head Negroes who were responsible for the government, which was responsible for the kind of sham investigation that was down there. Uh -huh. Handkerchief head Negroes who were more concerned about embarrassing Atlanta than they were about stopping That's the right. death of children in Atlanta. That's right. They were just nothing but low down handkerchief head Negroes. That's what they were. Andrew Young and the rest of them. That's what they were. And so what the situation is, is that they love to put Wayne Williams on the TV set as the so-called criminal. Right. At the same time that over 50 Ku Klux Klan tramp camps are trainings precisely for what happened to the Atlanta kill, mm -hmm. to kill black people in America. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, it's so silly with this situation where they try to hide white criminality and show you black criminality that up in the city of New York, where at the same time that the Atlanta killings were going on in New Rochelle, New York, I should correct that, New Rochelle, not New York City. At the same time, children were disappearing in the city of New Rochelle. They said some black children and some white children were disappearing. And they had a description of the person involved. And they went on and gave the description of the man and didn't even give his race. You imagine that? I mean, how are you going to recognize the person? They didn't know his name. How are you going to recognize him? They won't even tell you he's black and white. Well, he just had brown hair. Uh, he was just tall. He just had thin lips. Right? He just had a pointed nose. Right? You know, he was a white man. That's exactly what he was. But they wouldn't tell black people that in New Rochelle, New York, because they knew it had implications not only on that, but the situation down in Atlanta. Yes, we need self-defense. Right. There's no question about it. And quiet as it's kept, we need some self-offense, too. Oh, all right. All right. All right. That's what the Black Liberation Army and others are giving us, some self-offense. Uh -huh. Malcolm also talked about internationalization. What Malcolm meant when he talked about internationalization or international in the, nationalizing the struggle is that he was telling us it was foolish for us to keep walking around here talking about civil rights, <coughs> talking about the United States Supreme Court talking about the United States government and taking our grievances to the court and the government who were responsible for the crimes that we were protesting against. Uh -huh. That's like going to the person who just got finished raping you, asking him to give you some justice from being raped. Right. It didn't make any sense. Right. And so he says that you don't go to the criminal's court, it's what you do is you take the criminal to court. Uh -huh. And so in order to do that, we have to internationalize our struggle. Right. We have to begin to think of ourselves not as just some little citizens of the United States of America, which we in fact not, not as just some peons, some subjects of the United States of America controlled by their laws and their constitution, which was a white apartheid constitution to start off with. Yeah, and it always amazes me how black people fall in love with U.S. law so quick. <laughs> All these pretty words that they write in those constitutions, they don't read the whole constitution. If you read the whole constitution, it would tell you about itself itself, right? The constitution was an apartheid document which said that black people were only three-fifths of people for political representation for them, who said that black slaves had to be returned to their masters or else the people who kept them and let them be free would have to go to jail. It was an apartheid document which guaranteed the slave trade for 20 years after the Constitution was actually legislated and passed. And so we deal with an apartheid document, and some of us fall in love with it. But Malcolm said that was nonsense, is that we have to go to the world court. We've got to take our case to the United Nations, and we've got to start doing the things which are now necessary for us to create the alliances with other people in the world, so that going to the world court and the United Nations will be worthwhile, if you know what I mean. In other words, the primary problem with these two apparatuses right now is that they have no power to enforce the decisions that they make. And in fact, the most important body in the United Nations is the Security Council. And on the Security Council, you find all the crooks. You find the gays, the nation, the bandits, the lawless ones themselves. They're given the responsibility of enforcing the law. You imagine that? I mean, because when the United Nations were put together, it was a criminal organization. It was a bunch of thieves and rogues and imperialists who had stolen Africa who put together the United Nations talking about they were going to go for peace and self-determination. They didn't really ever believe it. But then Lumumba and Nkrumah and Pinata began to lay something on them. 
They begin to raise up revolutions over there in Africa and begin to hit crackers in the back of their head and begin to chase them out of Africa. And before you know it, a United Nations, which was a bunch of white folks, became a United Nations, which is now a bunch of black folks. And the United Na the States is talking about pulling out of it. They don't like to be around black folks. But you know how it is when you move into a neighborhood and white folks move out. The black nations have moved into the United Nations and now the United States is ready to move right on out. The United States is the granddaddy of all those white folks who move out of your neighborhoods when you move in. And so the situation is, though, is that we have to internationalize ourselves. We have to create international alliances so that we can internationalize our struggle. We've got to begin to think of ourselves as a people as a nation of people. Mm -hmm. You can't belittle, belittle yourself to think that you had no rights that other human beings have. Now George Jack, George Johnson, George, what's that fellow's name? Washington, right? <laughs> George Washington. <laughs> See, I know <laughs> black history so well, I'm from here my black history. <laughs> organization understand that. We believe in land. We've got to have some land in order to be true revolutionaries. That's what Malcolm said. You heard him say it right there on the tape. That's what he said. I mean, all these people going around here calling themselves Malcolmites and don't have their feet firmly on the ground. You know what I'm saying? They don't have their feet down the earth. Their minds are all afloat. Talking about we can get power in space and power through technology. They don't realize that the people who control the space and the technology are the same people who control the land. That's how you get control of the space and the technology, is by controlling the land. Now, who do you know that don't control no land that's controlling some space and some technology? Everybody controlling space and technology either, in fact, control some land or work for somebody else that control land. And so this is the situation here. So Malcolm brought it right down to terms. He said, look, if you're scared, then just don't fight, get in the closet, don't give us a whole lot of BS solutions. If you're scared to fight, then just say it. I mean, don't go around here telling us that we're going to reform the Democratic Party. We're going to reform the United States government. The Democratic Party is a white, racist, white supremacist organization. I was somewhat amused. When recently I was reading newspaper articles which said, and I quote, that the Democratic Party is moving to the right, <laughs> and that Coleman Young is upset. I said, where has Coleman Young been on this? <laughs> and I know he's older than me. <laughs> the Democratic Party is not moving to the right. The Democratic Party was born on the right. It was the Democrats who created the Ku Klux Klan. It was Southern Democrats who created the Know Nothing Party and the White Mother So and Circle, who took our brothers and sisters out from their city council positions in Canton, Mississippi, and elsewhere, and executed them in the street. It was the Democratic Party that created such a history of terror in the South after the Reconstruction days that. The, the, the United States Senate report of 1876 stated that in fact the government of Mississippi, South Carolina, and other states had been created on nothing but pure terror, on the killing and the rape and the murder of human beings. That's right. And that in fact the governments which controlled those states at that time did not even have the right to be recognized in the humane world. Yeah. But then they ended, of course as all good white reports do. <laughs> we will recognize them anyway mm. in order to support the cause of peace. Mm -hmm. Whose peace mm. are we talking about? Mm. This was a Republican writing about that situation with the Democrats. Mm. But they were recording history. And it's in their own congressional record. And so the situation is this. We need some land and we need some self-determination. Right. 
We need what has been called revolutionary new African nationalism. Mm -hmm. What we need is a resolve to have a revolution which will begin to give our children a free future. Mm -hmm. What we need is nationalism, a nation, a real nation, mm -hmm. a nation on earth. A nation that's not just somewhere in your head, or somewhere in your church when you go to church, or somewhere in your closet when you go to get your darshiki and your tikis. We need a nation that's down the earth. Nations and tikis and darshikis and spirits and spirits don't do very well unless they got some ground that they can manage. And so being revolutionary new African nationalists in the spirit of Malcolm X, we say that we need land in America. That's right. And everybody says, well, you can't have the five states in the South. Everybody knows that black folks can't take that from white folks because white folks are too tough. Mm -hmm. The United States government's got bombs. They drop bombs on people. Mm -hmm. Certainly they drop bombs on people. They drop bombs on the Vietnamese people. Mm -hmm. And look where Vietnam is today. Right. They block, drop bombs on you right now. You don't have to have a nation in order to be bombed out. You go out here and look at this community out here and tell me it doesn't look just like Germany right after the bombs, right? You got houses all torn down. You got places all torn up and roads all broken up and homes all broken up and heads all broken up and glass all broken up. You live in the most bombed out societies in the world. I've been to bombed out societies in Germany. I know how they look and I tell you, you live in a bombed out society. Now they haven't dropped any bombs from the sky. But what they've done is they drop little dope, little white chemicals down into your kids. And these little chemicals get into your children's veins and they get into this dope trance and they begin to crawl through windows. They begin to burglarize their next door neighbors and their mamas and their daddies and all of a sudden you have bombed out communities. You live in a worse kind of bombing situation than most people in the world live. Because yours doesn't happen all at once so it can get over with. Yours happens year after year and day after day so you've got to suffer and suffer and suffer. This is the situation we live in. You saw it in those slides that we just saw just a few minutes ago. So yes, we think we need some land and some self-determination. We think that if people got the guts to take it, then we can take it. Right. We think that if we can get enough people in the areas in the South, which are already majority black, to stand up and say, U.S. Postal Service, you can't go through here. <laughs> United States government, we are not going to cooperate with you. We're not going to work for you no more. We're not going to buy from you no more. We're going to seek different alternatives and we strike when it's best to strike and we work only when it's best for us to work and that we boycott when it's best to boycott. These are things which have been done already. The South is filled with strikes and boycotts from time to time over the Civil Rights Movement. The only problem is we've been boycotting and striking sometimes around the wrong thing. We haven't been boycotting and striking around the drive to win our independence but just been basically dealing with the problems which come from us not being in the print. Right, right. We've been dealing with people being raped in the South. Yeah, that's something to boycott over, but you're going to have to boycott and get about that next year again because they're going to rape somebody else if you don't fundamentally change the system which causes the rapes in the first place. Oh. So what we say is that we need that kind of resilience in the national territory. Mm -hmm. We need people of courage. That's what we need. Right. If you don't have courage, then we really don't need you. But we need people who have courage and who will plant their feet firmly on the ground and who will say that I'm taking over this territory where I stand. We need supportive actions. Supportive actions, first of all, in our own nation and amongst our own people. We need people in Detroit and Los Angeles. In Los Angeles where they build airplanes which fly in the sky and drop bombs on people, right? People in Detroit where they build tanks that kill people overseas and all over the world. People in New York where Rockefeller is. People who live in a vicinity of the major industry of the United States of America. We need people, peekaboo army kind of people, who will in fact do things which is necessary to support our struggle and to enhance our struggle. Unlike the Vietnamese, when they bomb us, if we're smart, we can bomb back. This is one thing that the Vietnamese couldn't do. They never could bomb the Americans. They just had to fight off the bombs. But as long as you're walking around in the city of Detroit and you still know how to make a Molotov cocktail, mm -hmm. then you can do some bombing, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the reality. That's what scared them about 67. And let me know, let me tell you, they were definitely scared. Mm -hmm. We also need some very much overground <coughs> We need teachers, educators, doctors, lawyers, who will begin to condition and train our people to provide services for themselves. We need people who will hook up with the Africans and hook up with the Caribbean community in order to, to, order to provide a triangle of trade, which would be a new African triangle of trade. 
A triangle of trade which would involve the new African nations on the African continent, number one, because those are the new African nations over there, just like we're a new African nation here. Prior to colonialism, prior to the time that the white man came in, there was no such thing as Tanzania. There was no such thing as Zimbabwe. No such thing as the nation of, of, of South Africa. There were, in fact, what there were, there were a number of different tribal nations, which our people had a right to. But at this point in time, because of colonialism, our people have been put into different constructs of nations, for the most part, larger nations, and they are also new African nations. So just like you were being colonized over here in America, and that Kikuhu blood, and that Zulu blood, and that Ashante blood was all going into you and merging into you to make you a pan-African person, a new African person, a kind of African person which didn't exist before colonialism, the same thing was happening to brothers and sisters in Africa. And so we got new African nations in Jamaica. We've got a new African nation in, in Guyana and a new African nation throughout the Caribbean community. So we must begin to try to take advantage of trade relationships, begin to develop trade relationships, and certainly begin to develop a, spont uh, a, a, a solidarity of struggle with our African brothers and sisters, which will carry us through a struggle that will make trade relationships worthwhile. Now, don't misunderstand me now. You can listen to some other people and misunderstand them, but don't misunderstand me on this subject, right? I don't think you can buy your way out of slavery. I don't think you've got enough money to do it, quite as okay. I don't think that you can go out and plan an economic program which is going to be grand enough, big enough, and great enough just to get out of slavery. Economics is extremely important. They must be considered. We must work on them, and we must work vigilantly. But it's not going to stop you from the responsibility of fighting. Right. If you're gonna, not going to fight, then don't bother to build it. Right. Because once you build it, remember this, it becomes a target for the enemy. <laughs> Anything you build and you don't have the defenses to defend or the struggle to pursue, it becomes a target for the enemy. And what happens? You remember Palestine? Mm -hmm. You remember the Palestinian Liberation Organization that built various different things over in Palestine and the Jews just came in and wiped them out? Mm -hmm. You remember the Nation of Islam's great monetary and institutionalized empire as it dealt with building different stores around and different uh, community operations. It was a good thing that Elijah Muhammad did. But the reality was that at a certain point in the development of the Nation of Islam, because of the help of the FBI and other right-wing folks, they began to become more concerned about the stores than they did about the movement. Right. They thought that perhaps they could avoid fighting. Maybe the ally was going to come down and right. everybody. Come on. But the reality was, and they, and they began to reject Farrar's understanding of Allah. Because what, Allah, what Farrar said is that Allah, at least is the way that he worked in the world, worked through the collective power of black people. That's what he right. said. But now they, they rejected that. And at a certain point, what happened is that they began to try to save the institution <coughs> worry about getting along with the government, worry about getting along with Mayor Daley over there, and the racist governor who was over there, put the governor and the mayor's picture in the paper, and talking about what great white folks they were because they were going to give up a little change to the nation of Islam. This is what happened. You must remember this. No two powers can occupy the same space at the same time. So if you're in the process of building a power, you better be in the process of eliminating the other. So this is what we must do. So, But we need some economic development, and we need some self-determination in land. And we think that we can win this struggle if we, in fact, not only through the various different resolve in terms of agitational activities, non-cooperation with the system, military activity in terms of us who are overground legally building self-defense groups. Everybody needs a self-defense group. You need one in your neighborhood. If you don't have one, then go home and start organizing one. Right. That's the reality. You're the only one that's going to stop crime in your community. Right. You know good and well the police are not going to stop. That's right. They're the one that started. Right. They were the first criminals. And they're still criminals. And that's not just bad mouthing them. That's just history. We must know our history. Do you know in 1960s we had the lowest black-on-black -black crime rate that we've ever had before then or after then? What was happening is that our youth energies were being utilized to walk out of those schools that were racist, to walk out of those colleges that were racist, to chain those colleges down to fight the real enemy. The Panthers put them on the street. That's what the Panthers did. They sat it there on the street and they started talking about off the pig and selling newspapers. That was utilizing the energy that a young youth who lives in a violent society has to utilize. There's no other way he can do it. If you don't put him to do some work which is positive to the movement, then he will do some work which is destructive, not only to the, community, to the movement, but to the community itself. That's the situation. 
But the police not only tried to stop the demonstrations and stop the constructive energy of the youth, but they also stepped in and they destroyed the leadership, the Panthers and the Republic of New Africa's provisional government and a number of other organizations around the country. They began to take the leadership off the street, to put them in jail and to kill them, thereby leaving the youth without leadership, giving the youth the godfather and the super fly image and the dope man and a number of other things to lead them. And then when the youth began to misbehave and to begin to call their own, call their own community problems, then what do they do? They turn around and call them criminals. The, the, they're hypocrites. They turn around and call our youth criminals when they're the master criminals themselves. Mm -hmm. They put them in jail for carrying a knife or a gun, yet they don't put the people in jail who made the knife and gun that they carry, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is the situation that we have. And so we feel that it is absolutely necessary for self-defense. It is absolutely necessary that we also begin to develop the international relationships which will bring us this land. We must develop relationships with the Native Americans. We have, we have a historical relationship with the Native Americans. We have a historical relationship with Native American people. And if they forget it, then you remind them. Mm -hmm. I mean, don't be sold on this building. I heard somebody the other day say, well, look, yeah, you know, we wasn't so cool to the Native Americans. We helped the white man take their land. Well, I mean, some of us have helped the white man do all kinds of things. <laughs> I mean, there's been some of us who helped the white man get us from Africa. Yeah. We certainly will not be held responsible for that. I mean, you hold it responsible for it if you tolerate it and if you help promote it, right? We uh, helped the white man go over in Vietnam and fight. In the Second World War, as a matter of fact, every low-down, dirty thing that the white man did, he went and got some handkerchief head Negroes, mm. uninformed ones, the ones by force, and drug them right into the yes, same story. Right. And so the reality is that that's, of course, true. But the Native Americans also have been victimized in that same way. Native Americans, in many instances, helped the white man catch slaves and bring them back to the plantation. Native Americans held black people as slaves at the time of the time. But we don't hold the Native Americans responsible for that because that's not the predominant experience of the Native Americans. We don't pick out a handkerchief head Native American and judge the whole Native American people by that handkerchief head Native American. Right? And so we don't expect to be judged by a handkerchief head either, right? So the reality is, though, we have historical relationships. When the Seminoles fought in Florida, that was an African red nation flight in Florida. Yes, right. That was a combination of Choctaw and Africans, Maroons, who had slipped out of the plantation and joined with the Native American in order to fight the white man. That's right. And the Seminole Wars are some of the most historic wars yes, against sir. the white man in this country. Mm -hmm. And so we have a political and a military relationship with the Native American. You've got Native American blood running around here in your veins. That's yes, right. Sir. And so we understand that we also have been moved upon the Native American land or the land where they inhabited in the southeastern portion of the country. <laughs> And through no fault of our own, we were brought here, and what we have done is, with our slave levers, develop that land. Now, when you start talking about land, you can't separate the land from the development of the land. No, sir. I mean, they can't send you back to Africa and give you a bridge and a road to put in your pocket to take with you. you know? no. They can't give you the kind of wealth that was created in Henry Ford's and General Motors to take back with you. And, you, and there's no reason for you to be subject to that. The reality is, is that we are entitled to land ourselves. Right. We are absolutely entitled to land ourselves. And the Native Americans don't take issue with that. They have already told us that they're willing to sit down with us and to negotiate on the question and to come to a resolve which will guarantee self-determination for black people in America. Right. The Native Americans say that. It's only other people with these polemics and who are trying to raise contradictions that say something different. But the reality is, is that we need this land, this self-determination, and this revolutionary nation. We also need unity, brothers and sisters. We need unity. <coughs> and so Malcolm taught us that. Malcolm taught us about unity. What Malcolm taught us is that we must come together as a people. Now, we must understand now that unity is not a romantic affair. You don't just fall in unity any more than you just fall in love. Mm. The reality is that unity is always a constant struggle. Mm. The way we come about unity is having experiences, political experiences with one another, being honest with one another, beginning to criticize our faults and to congratulate us and support us on the things that we do right. We must do that inside of our organization. We must do that outside of our organization. We must do that between organizations, and we must do that as a community as a whole. But we must be, not be liberal, and we must not be non-critical. 
We must not just fall for hanky-panky because it's popular at the time. Right. Because that kind of unity will never get you anywhere. It will always be self-destructive in it. And as I talk to that, something very recent comes to mind. Now, I feel very good about talking about this now, but a few months ago, we were certainly in the dead minority. Mm -hmm. yes, you remember the Jesse Jackson case. Yes, you remember the Jesse Jackson case? Oh, and then what happened at that time is we supported all of our brothers in terms of whatever they wanted to do with the campaign, but we said at that time, we didn't support Richard Nixon, we didn't support <laughs> Shirley Chisholm, we didn't support Elvis Cleaver when he ran for president, and we wasn't going to support Jesse Jackson. No, we weren't going to oppose him, but we weren't going to support him. Right. Not because we didn't like Jesse Jackson, but because we don't like the United States president. Oh, right. We don't like it at all. Yes, we sir. think it's a low-down, rotten institution. Oh, right. and we don't think there's anything that can happen there that's going to help us. That's right. Right. We don't need somebody, a white social democrat like Mark Mondale, who's nothing but a white supremacist. Yes, sir. A white social democrat is nothing but a white supremacist who promises you stuff, right? Indeed. We don't need people like that. They're not going to do us any good. Mm -hmm. And even a black social democrat, regardless of how and well-intended they are, are not going to do us any good in that office. Let's understand the the, 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 man of the, 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 the diameter of the problem. The dimensions of the problem. The dimensions of the problem is this. We're living in an empire. Hmm. We're living in an empire called the United States of America, which is nothing but an empire. It is not a nation. It is an empire. That's right. The dynamic of the problem is that the United States of America holds captive many nations within its borders. That's right. The Mexican nation, mm -hmm. the Puerto Rican nation, mm -hmm. uh, the Native American nation, mm -hmm. the the New African nation, the Hawaiian nation, the Alaska, you know, people in Alaska, all kinds of things. They, they don't, this is empire. And people take issue with that. But why would you take issue with that? When they told you that Rome was empire, you didn't take issue with that. Because the empire they built basically the same way. Rome was a little bitty place. And then they went out robbing everybody else's land. The United States didn't even have a little bitty place. They came off the boat robbing people. <laughs> So what they did is after taking this land and enslaving people under the notion of manifest destiny, they have enveloped this empire. Now the president of the United States of America is the manager, the caretaker of the empire. It's like the caretaker of the plantation. I mean, there's some liberal ones and there's some conservative ones. But essentially, as long as they run the plantation, then in fact, it's still a plantation. And you still got problems. You still got slavery. So it really doesn't matter who's in the seat unless they're going to destroy the seat itself. Mm -hmm. Now, nobody's going to run for the office. Well, maybe some people will. We might. I don't know. But right now, we don't see the person. We don't see the person who's prepared to run for the office in order to destroy the office. And that's what the commitment must be. We put mayors into mayoral seats. I know about it because I come from Detroit. To get our human rights. And they come back and tell us we can't do it. Why not? Because the office doesn't work that way. Well, we didn't put them in there to work the office. We put them there to get the human rights. Right? And so, but that's the reality. They are restrained by certain things. See, we don't need Jesse Jackson to give us a few more jobs or to give us a few more black faces and white places. That's not what we need. What we need is a fundamental change in the structure of the society and the controls that are over us. What we need is not to get a little more taxes from Henry Ford and Dow Chemical Company and Rockefeller and General Motors. We want the whole thing. That's what we need. In other words, we need for those places to be taken over and dismantled and for us to be paid our reparations. That's what we need. Anything short of that is going to leave our people in the same condition that they're already in. There is no alternative. History has made it abundantly clear. We've been here for 400 years. If we don't learn now, we will never, never know. to go over to Syria and get hanging your head Negroes who drop bombs on Lebanese people for white people? Yeah. That's not the kind of international politics we need. We don't need people to go down to Cuba to get counter-revolutionaries in order to bring them up here to help the Americans, to bring counter-revolutionary pressure on us. Those same people that Jesse went to God are the brothers and the sisters, politically speaking, of the people who are over here in the Watergate thing operating and trying to destroy our movement. That's right. So why would we need some more of them here? What we need is people who will walk up to the White House or wherever they got to go and however they got to do it and wherever they got to do it 
in order to free some of our prisoners of war who are in jail. Right. If you're going to raise an issue, raise the issue of Sekou cool Odinga who's in jail. Right. Raise the issue of Asada Shakur who they're searching for all over the country. Right. Raise the issue of Matulu Shakur who they're searching right. for. Right. Raise the issue of the Black Liberation Army and Geronimo Pratt who they framed right. up That's in jail. Right. Those are the issues we need. Free right. some of those people. Then, then you're talking the kind of black political and economic and uh, international policy that we need to hear. That's right. But we don't need people to do things which basically attempt to paint a rundown, dirty, rotten house. I mean, you know, that's basically what we deal with when we deal with social democrats. I mean, they think that they can somehow rehabilitate the house. Now, America is not the kind of house that you can rehabilitate. It's fundamentally wrong. It's just like you got a house that's unsound structure. You can't just solve the problem by giving the, the house a new coat of paint. It'll never work. In the next few years, the roaches will come out of the cracks again. The rats will come running across the floor again. And the windows and everything else will start falling out. We've seen it happen all time and time again. Well, America, you must understand, is not a house that has gone wrong. America is a house that has never been right. It started wrong, and it's always been wrong, and the very fact that it exists, the way it exists, is in fact itself wrong. It's a denial of the self-determination of a number of people just to have a United States which control the upper part of Mexico, and then make it illegal for Mexicans to come across the border into the country which is there. So they set up illegal borders and then call the Mexicans illegal immigrants when they come over. It's fundamentally wrong for the Native Americans to have to live on reservations. Right. If you want to help the Native Americans, don't talk chump change to them. Give them those oil companies that's sitting on their land. Right. And it's fundamentally wrong for the Africans who were born into new Africans in the Southeastern Territory to be put in the kind of conditions that we're in. That's right. So this is what we must think of when we think of this question of unity. There were a number of things which we think perhaps could have come out of the Jesse Jackson campaign once it was going on. Because one thing it did make very clear it made very clear that America rejected black people and black people's candidates 110 or 130, 150, 200%. You know what I mean? I mean, white folks don't give a damn about you. Right. And now Malcolm asked the question in 1964, the ballot or the bullet? Now, if we haven't learned the answer to that question, yet, then we're way behind time. I mean, we're really uninformed. And so the situation is, is that in exposing that, and perhaps we felt as an organization would have been best for at the time that Jesse went to the convention and got absolutely nothing, that it would have been a good gesture for him to leave. And those of us who never went into the White House or the white man's house could have met them as they came out. This would have been a unity gesture and would have been true unity and moving toward true independence for our people. But see, we got some people who really don't really believe in that. They are as much in love with the notion of America as they are with you and maybe more in love with the notion of America than they are with you. Mm -hmm. They will wave that American flag, the same flag that the Ku Klux Klan carries, I mind you. And don't criticize the Ku Klux Klan for it, Karen. Their fathers made it, right? Mm -hmm. Not yours. Their fathers, the people who made it, believed the exact thing they believed mm -hmm. and had slaves to prove it, right? Mm -hmm. But the situation is, is that some people love America more than they love black people, and that is a problem. Mm -hmm. If you love this rotten, low-down government, and I can understand it because you've been brainwashed. Mm -hmm. You've been taught the wrong thing in school. Oh, They've been told you about it, and some of your political officials and your so-called leaders really believe it. Mm -hmm. Deep down in their heart, they think that someday America's going to be redeemed. Mm -hmm. Quiet as it's kept, they think it's already redeemed because they got a few more bucks, right? Mm -hmm. Because they get a few more dollars from the Zionists or from the Arabs or from the United States government. This is a problem. They, some of them are, it's, it's difficult to call for unity with people who are at war with you. You understand what I mean? And it really, when you call for uncritical unity, what you do is try to put the black people in the same house who don't belong in the same house. Now, the masses of our people belong in the same house. But they don't belong in a house with handkerchief head leadership, which don't even love the masses, don't trust them, and hate them, and in fact think the masses are criminals themselves. Now, what's that Roy Ennis over there? You remember Roy Ennis, the political confidence man, said that Getz was all right. And there's a lot of people that believe they disdain our people because the United States system has done a job on their head, just like they did to Uncle Tom. You remember Uncle Tom. Yeah, I don't see how you forget him. He's right here today. You know what I'm saying? But the historic Uncle Tom, the historic Uncle you remember, he loved the master so much that, you know, when black people would do something against the master, he thought it was something against him. And so you've got 
N Uncle Tom Negroes nowadays using the modern version of white and black inferiority, going around here talking about, well, the youth are criminals and they deserve what they get. So in Detroit, they set up all kinds of situations in the schools where the schools look exactly like the prisons now, right? I mean, they, when you walk through, you got to be searched and shut down. If you don't have a pass, you go to jail. If you, uh, if, if somebody in there is caught doing something wrong, they get expelled, and their mom and daddy get sued, right? Mm -hmm. And their mom and daddies can go to jail. But at least that's what they say. Mm -hmm. They, I don't think they can do that legally. But then again, I'm only a lawyer. <laughs> they are the law, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's one thing we must remember. <laughs> and so the reality is, is that, you know, we got to call for critical leadership and critical unity. We got to remember the six. Now, once we build this mass movement and our people come together, then anybody who earnestly comes to it, no matter from what class they come to, has a right to be there. You understand what I'm saying? But remember the 60s. Remember that we had some traitors. I mean, we not only had traitors in the clear sense, politically, that went out and told on people and got them in jail, but we had people who betrayed you. Once us who marched through those schools and through those streets, won black studies programs, won the right for various people to go to law schools and medical schools, some of the same clowns that we got into those schools came out and turned on us and said that now you don't need no more of that stuff no yes, more. Yes, you don't need the movement no more. Right. It's an individual question. Right. It's up to the individual to succeed. And if Negroes can't go and study well enough to succeed and they're not as smart as me, then in fact they don't deserve to finish law school and medical school. Now you imagine that. A dumb Negro talking about people being as smart as him, right? And now some of these same dumb Negroes are being moved on themselves. Once they get the people, then they go to the dumb Negroes because they don't need them anymore. So you see judges being prosecuted and mayors being prosecuted. You see all kinds of lawyers being prosecuted. Even the ones who are not trying to fight for the people because they get caught in all kinds of little shady activity that the white man's been doing for years and they got so white thinking they think they can do it. Yeah, right. Right. Not understanding the white man doesn't judge them the same way that he judges himself. Right? That's right. So this is what we have today. We have a crisis in leadership which must be understood if we talk about <laughs> unity in any particular context. Leadership is another thing that I'd like to share with you my thoughts on today, brothers and sisters. When we talk about leadership, there are some principles I think that we can take from Melvin X's life, which tell us about leadership and tell us about some of the principles that we should exercise in leadership. Now, in the New African People's Organization, as we are organized across the country, we don't believe in any one leader. We believe that all of us are training to be leaders. Right. Everybody must be a leader in the particular political organization because there's so much to be led. Right. In fact, there's room for leadership even outside of our organization. There's a number of things to be led. But we've got to be the correct kind of leader. We've got to have, as Malcolm demonstrated to us, is commitment. We must have commitment to the cause. You can't be a pansy-wansy, jive leader. You can't be a sometime leader. You can't be a part-time leader. Mm. Oh, i got to go to the show tonight. I don't have time to be a leader. <laughs> You've got to be a leader which laid on the job. I don't want to go see somebody fight. I want to go see the boxing match, so I don't have time to be a leader tonight. Right? Mm. The call is on, but I don't want to leave tonight. I want to do something else for a while. Mm. Reagan's got some money he wants to give me, so I want to go take the money, so I'll advocate <laughs> leadership. And then in a few years, Ralph Abernathy will come back and say, well, you know, I'm a leader again. I did wrong. <laughs> I'm all right, you know, <laughs> Muhammad Ali, poor brother, you know, <laughs> deranged in his head. I mean, really, poor brother, because it's a tremendous history of that brother, yeah. and we love him for his history. Yeah. But we must recognize the fact that his mind is damaged. Yeah. And so what do they do when they get damaged minds? I mean, this is really cruel, what they do to us. They throw them on posters, along with two boxes, who never did this. <laughs> We are for the man. I mean, they could have said, we are for the master, and meant the same thing. I mean, you know, really, they really don't have any respect for you. you know? I mean, they really don't. And then you didn't tear all the posters down, so perhaps you don't deserve it. We have got to get some respect. And you will get it when you take it. What they did in the 60s during the rebellions, when they put little white Madonnas in the community, they wouldn't paint them black. That's what they did. And so we have got to understand that it's time to move. Commit Courage. We can't have any chumps. And I think perhaps I've said enough on that already. We can't have any chumps. We can't have any people that talk bad and then when the action comes, oh my, we're moving. 
<laughs> We're moving too fast. Right. And sometimes we do move too fast. But you can't be out there in the middle of the battle and decide that you're moving too fast. I mean, you got to finish the battle, then you come back and correct your mistakes. I mean, what are you going to do? Leave the troops on the field and you go hide under the bed. We're moving too fast. I'm going to stop this right now. And so the reality is that we need people that's got courage. Courage to do what is necessary. Courage to recognize their mistakes when they make them and to admit them and to change them. We need also confidence, faith, iman, they call it in the Ibujo Sama. If you don't believe in it, then don't get it. I mean, I know that some people are wavering on the marginal line, on the margin. We don't worry about that. We don't worry about that because we don't convince you that Ronald Reagan and other forces like that with us. Right? But when you become convinced, then let's have confidence, let's have faith. Remember that we have done a lot of things that was always said we never could do. Right. I mean, even the little petty electoral victories we've won over the last few years, people said we never could do it. Right. I mean, the whole question of slavery, it looked to our people at the time that we would all be in slavery. Right. Why did this kept white people didn't win slavery, in slavery, we ended slavery. Right. We ended slavery with participation, with armed rebellions, with a number of other things that we did to even help the Union win the war at the point that the Union decided they were going to abolish slavery. Yeah. Which is not what they wanted to do at first. You should understand it. The first 13th Amendment of 1861, passed at the beginning of the war, was the 13th Amendment which guaranteed the South slavery forever. But the South rejected that because the war really wasn't just about slavery. You know what I mean? And the South rejected that, and when they rejected that, then the North said, we're going to have to fight. And then two years later, when Lincoln realized he couldn't win without letting slaves go free, he freed slaves. Now, interestingly enough, the only slaves he freed were the ones that he didn't have any right to free. The only ones he freed were the ones in the Southern Confederacy, which was a territory that's controlled by the South. So he didn't have no jurisdiction over them because they had already broke. The ones in the territory that he controlled, the border states, as well as many counties in Alabama, Mississippi, and elsewhere, he never freed. Now, I mean, this is no secret stuff. I mean, this is in the very doctrine which talks about the freedom. Read the Emancipation Proclamation. It's there for people to read. It doesn't talk about liberty or wholesome or living or anything about do-gooding. It says military necessity. I got to do it. Oh, I hate it. I got to do it. I'm going to do it. I mean, they say Lincoln was honest. I think he was. It's what, Sick and absorb it's what people say about us, does not right? And so the reality is, is that what we live in a situation here when we talk about leadership is that we must have faith in our ability to conquer things. Historically, we have shown great ability to conquer. And it's only when you begin to lose faith in yourself that you lose that ability. Our struggles are tough. It's a hard one. We can't promise you anything. You've been in slavery for 400 years. I mean, what do you look like coming up looking for an easy struggle? Come on. I mean, that doesn't make sense. So of course it's going to be sacrificed. It's going to be life-taking and breathtaking and a number of other things. We need humble leadership. We need leaders who are also followers. And if you see somebody in the New African People's Organization who you think is not humble and who's not also ready to deal with other leadership, then you need to tell them that because that's what they're supposed to be doing. Right? Right. The reality is that we need humble leadership. Mm -hmm. We don't need any messiahs. We've had too many messiahs. We all must become part of the messiah that we need. right? Mm -hmm. We all must become part of that. We need humble leadership. A leader who is not able to follow is not fit to lead. Mm -hmm. If you cannot follow things, then you cannot lead things. Mm -hmm. We need people who have theory and who have practice. We don't need people in major leadership who just theorize all the time, who have another idea, you know. And if you can't accept their idea, then they don't want to deal with you, right? right. The reality is, is, certainly, theory can always be improved. But there's not a whole lot of things that haven't been talked about in our 400 years of struggle. So what we need is some practice. We need people that's going to do the work. And most of all, I think when we talk about leadership, we need some love. I mean, the fundamental <coughs> commitment of a leader must be the love for his people. Mm -hmm. And that must not be some kind of sham, jive thing. The sister or the brother who takes leadership must love their people. Mm -hmm. You know how important it is? I would venture to say that unless we have an undestructible love for our people, if you don't love the people, then you will eventually betray them. I will say that, that if you don't love them, then somewhere down the line you're going to betray them. Because this is too tough of a struggle. There are too many things that you've got to confront. There's going to be too many times that you're going to want to say there's an easier way than this, right? And if you don't love the people, then you will betray them. History, 
A sense of history is the last point I would like to talk about as it relates to the principles which Malcolm has left us. He left us a sense of history. And in leaving us this sense of history, what he taught us is that history has a relationship to the future. Mm -hmm. I think Malcolm is the one who said that of all of our studies, history is best qualified to reward all research. And what he was saying is that what we needed is history that would help us prepare for the future. Now, some people will tell you, you don't need history. You don't need history. I'll forget it. You know, forget what you know, happened before. Let's now do uh, a new thing and a better thing. But we know that just like if you came in now, and if you missed the first part of my speech, that is history. And this part of my speech is at present, and the next couple of words I will say will be in the future. And I will end this speech in the future, and hopefully not too distant future. <laughs> and, but the reality is, is that if you didn't understand the first part of the speech, if you wasn't here to hear it, if you didn't know anything about it, then it's very difficult to understand what's being said now. People who would try to move into the future of our history are like people who would try to read only the last paragraph of a book That's right. and think they understand it, or the last verse of a song and think that they've captured the essence of it. I mean, you might be able to get a little bitty part of it, but you wouldn't be qualified to lead me or any of you in that kind of, that kind of a sense. I mean, you have to be cautious about a person that comes around all the time ready to lead you somewhere and never knows where he's already been. You know? That's right. I mean, if somebody did that to you, you would never follow him anywhere. Well, a leader that doesn't give any emphasis to history is the same kind of thing. History we are not to be trapped in. It is important, as we have said in the last few weeks several times, is that we talk about history, but not for the purposes of being nostalgic. In other words, we don't just endlessly look back and try to emulate and imitate the ways of the past. Mm. That is not struggle. It is fine to wear our pretty darshikis and tikis and other things and to emulate some of the ways of our ancestors, but it is absolutely crazy to think that we, all we have to do in this struggle, or even the most thing that we have to do, is to try to do what somebody did 100 or 200 years ago, or even farther back than that, right? It doesn't make sense. The reality is, is that history is to be used as a doorway to the future. Right. You should not be trapped in history. You should not always be trying to do nothing but be distorted. You should, in fact, be forward-looking. We must make history. And this is the final and perhaps the most important point as it relates to history. We must make history. History is made. We in the New African People's Organization say that we are dialectical materials but we are also historical materials. Mm -hmm. What that means, that's not just a fancy word, and quiet as it's kept, we're, we're definitely not marxist Lenin. so get that straight, all right? <laughs> but Marx and Lenin didn't invent dialectical materials. Yes, that's right. Right. You remember yeah. Agnotum, who that's talked right. about the unity of opposites? Right. Mm -hmm. He was a black man, that's he was right. an Egyptian, right. and other people dealt with it. <laughs> but what we deal with in that is that in the world, things are always contradictions, and when the contradictions battle each other, then something new results, right? And so you must understand that, even in your families or in your home, there's certain contradictions, and these things are not to be feared, but they're to be courageously confronted, and we must resolve the contradictions so our families and communities will be harmonious, so that whatever is created out of the conflict will be what is best for all. That's what we talk about. But people who would think that, they, that, that history comes in some kind of fatalistic way, in other words, that we are predestined to do certain things and that we don't have to really worry about it, that it'll just happen. That's not the kind of history we're talking about. We make history. We make the conditions or have made the changes in the conditions which are necessary to make the changes in our lives. And in fact, I would say that if you are not making your own history, then somebody is making that history for you. And that has been the problem that we have had. There are those who tell us, forget history, let bygones be bygones. The only problem with that is that our bygones are not gone yet. <laughs> In other words, those things which oppress us have never passed us by. Right. We are still living in the same situation that we have always lived in in America. That's right. It is not the essence of our economic situation that we were slaves or that we now earn wages when we work, if we can work today, right? The essence of our situation, which creates us in a lower underclass status, is that underclass <coughs> colonial status itself. We are an underclass. 
In other words, we are under all the classes in America. Right. Right. And that is so from a historical point of view because America put us in that situation when it claimed illegal jurisdiction over us. <laughs> we are now only employed black men by 59%. In 1950, 73% of black men were employed. In 1984, 59% of black men are employed. By 1989, 40% of black men will be unemployed. And they do not want to predict beyond that for fear that you might get mad and do something. Right? Mm -hmm. The reality is, mm -hmm. is that that is no kind of future to promise to your youth. And then at the same time, tell them not to snatch purses, break windows, and get on doors. If you don't have anything to promise them, then they might as well snatch windows, break, and get on doors. I mean, like, death is death. And so the thing is, is that we're going to promote life, let's do it totally. Let's try to get out of this situation. 57% of white income is all that black families make. Politically, we are disenfranchised. We are disenfranchised. Now, I know people will say, but well, show way we vote all the time, we vote on this, and we vote on this that don't make no difference, and that don't make no difference, right? The reality is that voting is not the essence of political That's power. Right. That's right. The essence of political power is what they call the allocation of valued things in a society. In other words, political power decides who gets what, when, and how. And if you don't decide who gets what, when, and how with your vote, then you might as well stop voting. Now, when's the last time you decided anything important with your vote? <laughs> I mean, almost nothing that happened to us in this society was either resolved of a vote one way or the other. You didn't get here because somebody voted to bring you here. You didn't go into slavery because somebody voted to put you in slavery. And you didn't get out of slavery because somebody voted to take you out. You didn't even get the civil rights legislation because of a vote. You got it because Kennedy died and because some brothers began to move in the street. That's why you got it. See, political power is decided by other ways than vote. The reality is, therefore, that we are disenfranchised because, first of all, anytime you have economics which make you a subservient people, put you at the bottom, then that decides the political question itself. The economic situation always shackles the political one. There's no way that you can be a slave economically and be a free person politically. That's the insanity of the South African proposition today. You have people today who, understanding that ANC, Understanding that other revolutionaries over there are beginning to create turmoil and beginning to put the South African government in problems, now even the most conservative white people, Zionists themselves who support South Africa, right? And, and handkerchief had Negroes who never supported anything revolutionary, right? Are now getting up saying that they support the struggle in South Africa. Now they don't say they support the revolutionaries, our revolutionaries. <laughs> That's where you can tell the difference, right? right. Now, if you ask the person, do you support this young brother running around in the bush shooting people and blowing up buildings, and they say, yeah, then you say right on, right? <laughs> because he is the revolutionary carrying the future of the people in his hands. That's right. I mean, this stuff about just ending apartheid is nonsense. You had apartheid here. They call it Jim Crow. Right. <laughs> they say it so. How do you feel? <laughs> now, what do you look like trying to give somebody a solution that didn't even work for you? Right? <laughs> the reality is that the essence of a people's colonial situation is not just whether or not white folks can talk to black folks, right. sit on the stool with them, or even whether they can vote. If voting is meaningless because the economic structure is such that the people of all the wealth control who get elected. And that's what happens here. I mean, you know, before you ever decided whether you wanted to vote for anybody, they had already decided that there were going to be two knucklehead white people running, right? <laughs> and that the knuckleheaded white people, Mondale and Reagan, are basically from the same camp. They support the same thing. They support white supremacists, jurisdiction over our nation and other nations. They support sending troops to Central America. They support all those things. In fact, at one point, I wondered if Mondale wasn't out right and right, right? He was going so far to the right to prove to white folks that he was strong, too. He said, I don't have no problem with your military buildup, just that you ain't doing it right. That's what he said. And so the situation is, is they already, they paid for by the same people. I mean, Henry Ford purchases both of them. He throws monies in the both campaign. I mean, he didn't come here and tell you this good, good bad guy routine, this off and on routine, this yick and yang or yin and yang or uh, mutt and jeff routine. Uh, they bring in the Republican Party. The Republican Party is a good party at first. The Democratic Party is a bad party. And the Republican Party frees you from slavery. And then the Democratic Party becomes the good party and the Republicans become the bad party. It's nothing but a bunch of nonsense. 
It's a political confidence game. Now, how is the Democrats going to be your friends when Coleman Young, now they got some Negroes in the confidence game too, Coleman Young and Thomas Brett, <laughs> those people like that, they are supposed to be astute Democrats, right? Mm -hmm. And they, in fact, are friends with Henry Ford, all right? Coleman Young is great friends of Henry Ford. You're supposed to be one of the wonders of Detroit, you know? They're great friends of Henry Ford. They build Renaissance centers for them. They didn't build it for us, right? Mm -hmm. And so what they did is he's the friend of Henry Ford. Henry Ford is not only the friend of Reagan, but the prime benefactor of Reagan's economic policies. So how is Coleman Young going to be black people's friend and Henry Ford's friend at the same time? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, Henry Ford be Reagan's friend and Reagan be supported by the Ku Klux Klan. Mm. That means that Ronald Reagan, who is supported by the Ku Klux Klan, is the friend of the person that Coleman Young is the friend of. And, they both, and the prime benefactor, Henry Ford, is of Ronald Reagan. It's a political confidence game. There's no way that it could really happen that way in the real world. They all believe about the same thing. Coleman and them probably believe a few different things. But the reality of their economic and political politics and, and their politics and their actions put them right in the same camp. The situation is also that we live in a situation of social degradation. I'm not going to feel alone, spend a long time on this, but this is a, a continuing part of our history. Educationally, religiously, culturally, sports-wise, housing-wise, media-wise, we are totally degraded in this particular society. Our children don't really have an image worth looking at as it is portrayed to them in the media and religious institutions and elsewhere. They still look at white Jesuses on church walls. They still are filled with white nationalism. They not only see Tarzan and He-Man and Superman and Batman on TV, but they go out in the streets, which are named after people who own their great-great-granddaddies and great-great-grandmothers. They go to schools called Lincoln. They go to down streets called Washington Boulevard. They go to other places which are named after the most rotten people in the world, and we want to know why our children don't have a positive image of themselves. Now our children perhaps are a little smarter than we were years ago, because we just sucked in the whole inferiority thing, and we begin to adore people like Washington and Thomas Jefferson. Well, they can't totally get our children to do that. And so what they do is they give them other camouflaged Negro uh, half-witted images in order to do it, you know? They can't get them to go all the way of that, and so they got them chasing around after Michael Jackson and <laughs> Prince and people like that. I mean, people who represent the pollution of our culture, who represent the pollution of a rich black musical tradition and various other traditions, even the uh, different athletes who, who feel it that they are inevitably inclined to marry white women and things of that nature. This is who our children are given to <coughs> to admire and to adore. So the children don't have positive images of themselves because the society doesn't provide those issues, those, those, those uh, atmospheres or those avenues. Community security, we've already talked about. We live in a bad situation with community security. You remember Eula Love, and you certainly remember Ron Self. Mm -hmm. This situation is a predominant situation around the country. But now, not only do we have to be concerned about white racist violence, but we must be concerned about the Negro on black violence which white racist violence has created. We have to be concerned about people who have gone mad because of a mad society and who victimize their own people. So we live in an insecure situation. In this diabolical situation, we must remember that white supremacy is the thing that holds the situation together. I think we must understand that we have a mission. Our mission is to organize our people as a mighty force for freedom. This is the mission of the New African People's Organization, to organize our people in such a way that they will become a force for the freedom of themselves and the freedom for the other peoples in the world. We can't halfway do it, we can't short step it, we can't jive ourselves on it. It's an all the way process. We do small things today looking for a big tomorrow. We build community centers, we build the New African Scouts, which we ask youth to come into to learn them how to operate. We build men and women in the New African Security Union. We build a security image and a security reality. If you know anything about the New African Independence Movement, you know that we don't just talk when we talk about self-defense. We have a history of doing it to people who try to do it to us, you know what I mean? That's the FBI, right? And the Jackson Police and the rest of them. We're proud of that history. 
I'm proud as I can be, is that when the police came in 1969 and attempted to kill Milton Henry, who at that time was the vice president of the Republic of New Africa, that the black legionnaires let those police leave in stretches, and one of them dead, right? I'm proud as I can be, is that when they went down to Mississippi, and that they had killed all these Panthers all across the country, and when they walked in in August the 18th of 1971 and attempted to take the life of 11 black men and women, and, and one woman who was pregnant, so had a child in her belly, that when the gunfire cleared, the ambulance that the police had brought with them in advance, anticipating trying to kill some of our people, none of our people had to get in it. They carried their own people way in stretches, right? right. On, I'm right. proud as I can be of, of Fred Ahmed Evans, who took it to the police in the city of Cleveland. I'm proud as I can be of other New Africans, like the New Africans who came from California, up north. You don't know there's a lot of this history, and so this is why I'm telling you about it. A brother named Antar Rob, him and two other comrades were on their way to Mississippi <coughs> after the Army 11 were arrested, intercepted in New Mexico, and when a police officer tried to take them out, they took him out. They not only took him out, but they got a plane, and they diverted it. In other words, they took a detour to Cuba, if you know what I mean. <laughs> they were accepted as revolutionaries in Cuba in a very short period of time. These men became to be heroes to the Cuban people. When, when at, the, at one point in time, a Cuban sister was drowning in a river, and Brother Antar Ra, who was a, a very exemplary revolutionary, in fact, a brother who had a master's in mathematics, and who was also from the streets, a brother jumped into the river to save the sister, saved her, but took his own life because he had taken in too much water. So those are our real heroes, and we need to know about them. But we build people like this in this new African independence movement, and we're proud of the people we build. And so we have this new African security union which is here and which is standing here with you today and which will protect you in every chance that it gets an opportunity to do so. But more importantly, will give you a path to protect yourself. This is what is important. We must build community security operations. We must, in fact, build other institutions which are necessary. The Uhuru Sasa School, which is held here on Saturdays, is an example of that. The youth programs in Detroit, where we've taken youth and supposedly one of the worst parts of Detroit, brought them into our Malcolm X Community Center for Black Survival. And right now, you who sung silly rap songs and listen to Prince all the time, now make rap songs about the new African independence movement. Right. We're very proud of that. We're proud about the fact that wherever the action is, that's where you find a new African people's organization. We're not just a sit-back institution-building organization. We do believe in institutions, and we do believe in supporting people who build them. But at the same time, we're proud, of, I also think, when I see Naima over there, of Omawali Shoelake, which has been there for years, and which was one of the things in the new African independence movement out in Pasadena, California. But we're also proud of the fact that when the South African real demonstrations come down, mm -hmm. then we're there. Not the phony ones, not the theater, the protest, where people arrange to be arrested and get out at 5 o'clock, you know. Look, you know, man, I got to be out of here. You know, that's me, get me out of here right away and make sure all the news media get a hold of it. They had a demonstration in Detroit. They had a demonstration in Detroit where Coleman Young and some other big, big time, you know, like uh, the head of UAW, I can't think of his name right now. But all these, these clowns, the same kind of clowns that participated in 1963 in the March on Washington, same kind of clowns that participated in the most recent march, all the people who participated in the most recent march I don't think were clowns, but the core of them were. And so these kind of people all marched on the federal building in Detroit. And they had barricades which they set up, not to keep the white races away, but they set barricades up around a small demonstration of these Elites so that the people who had come there to demonstrate against South Africa couldn't get to them and get in the march. So here's some people who are supposed to be fighting for freedom, and they're afraid of the very people who they're supposed to be fighting for freedom for. Now you know there's something, there's a contradiction in that. But we go to the real demonstrations. And even inside of the somewhat shaky ones, we're going to be in there advocating and trying to push it to the left as much as we can. We are involved in Battle Creek. We're fighting a police terror and police state. In Battle Creek, we have a situation where people have been killed and been put in uh, various different uh, institutions and been harassed by grand jury for a long period of time. We're involved in Detroit in fighting against utility exploitation. So in Detroit, where it is very cold, as you know, there has been a record number of black people and elders dying each year because of the fact that the Michigan Consolidated Gas Company will turn off their gas. But once U.E.P. Newton said something which I thought was very real, and it went to the hearts of our young brothers and sisters who put this campaign together themselves, the youth, 
Huey said that the spirit of the people was greater than the man's technology. Right. And so what they did is when the gas man came to turn off the gas, there just happened to be a whole lot of people out there, right? right? And so the gas man got out of the town as quick as he possibly could. Every time he would come, we would find out about it, then there would be some people there. And he would turn the tail and run. <laughs> so what happened is ultimately the Michigan Consolidated Gas Company, <clears throat> realizing that this was a big issue, and it was a very unpopular one with them, called us up and said, well, look, anytime you really want to keep somebody's gas on, just let us know, and we'll try to keep it on. We won't turn anybody's gas off in the world. We've gone along with that for the time being, and we've actually saved 60 to 70 different people in their gas during the wintertime. Of course, that is not the solution. The solution is, is to free some land. People don't have the right to own gas companies and charge people for gas, which is pulled That's out right. from underneath the land which they stand on. We understand that. But we are also doing a number of different things around the country. We hope that you can join us. We really hope that you can join us. We have shown you a slideshow and we've made to you a presentation. Despite what the press says, there's nothing crazy about us. We all know what we are talking about. As a matter of fact, those who are in the movement, not only us, but people who take a sound judgment on the necessary for freedom for black people, are the only ones who have escaped the insanity which we are confronted with. We are a number of people and do a number of things. We have people who don't have jobs. Black people have people who don't have jobs. We have people who sweep floors. We have people who take care of children. We have people who teach children. We have people who are doctors. We have people who are lawyers. We have people who do a number of different things. We have people who are working for the freedom of their people with the skills that they have. We hope that you become one of those people. We would like to see many of you become members of the New African People's Organization. Members of an organization which, believe me, at this point in history, does not in fact reflect the tremendous institutional building potential of Marcus Garvey, does not at this point in history reflect the tremendous ability to put the people in confrontation with the system like SNCC, does not have the tremendous zeal to win the, or the tremendous ability at this time to win the propaganda warfare like the FBI said that the Panthers were, or the people who have, of course, the charisma of the Malcolm X. But believe me, that every one of those brothers and sisters live in this organization. They all live in us. And so all we have to do is to take these seeds and to cultivate them. And within days, months, or maybe years, we will put a movement on the streets that will not only shape the foundations of this racist society in North America, but will indeed crack the foundations of the imperialistic world. So I say thank you very much for listening and free the land.
but we tutor them in math and reading and African history and culture, and we teach arts and crafts and take them on field trips, and we try to give them a supplement to what they're getting. And we try to point out some of the contradictions to what they're getting and to teach them that there is more out there for them as black youth. Another program that we have here at uh, the Center for Black Survival that concentrates on the youth also is the New African Scouts. And I'm sure you saw them in formation. <coughs> Those sharp looking brothers and sisters That's with right. the red tents and the All spy right. presentation. Those are our New African Scouts. Right. All right. And with the Scout program, we're trying to combat the destruction of our youth. Joe Way mentioned that our youth are being criminalized. That's no accident. They're criminalizing our youth because they are the seeds of our struggle. If we have no youth to carry on the struggle once we're gone, then there is no struggle. So we have to come, and it's, the police are not the answer. We know that. We have to combat it within our limited resources, within our limited means. The scouts teach the children uh, urban survival skills. We teach them rural survival skills. We teach them self-respect. We try to teach them a love for new African people and a love for the struggle and a love for liberation so, they, so that they will carry on the struggle, so that they can be very fertile seeds for the growth of our liberation. Another program directed towards the youth, we're very youth-oriented, is the Freedom Now Bookstore, which is, as Brother Chokwe pointed out, a very small bookstore, but we can all make it grow. And it's the only bookstore in Los Angeles that is geared toward providing good reading material for black youth. Um, we have the African Institute of Martial Arts, which meets on Thursdays at 6.30 and Sundays at 10 o'clock, which we teach self-defense to anyone who wants to come down and learn how to defend themselves and the community. Um, we feel this stuff with this is very important. That's why we offer this as a free service to the community. Uh, we take all ages. Well, ages that can follow directions <laughs> <laughs> in the African Institute of Martial Arts. And I say that to emphasize that that is also for children. Because as the uh, Atlanta murders really highlighted, our children are just as much as different as we are. As a matter of fact, since children are so innocent and trusting, they're even more of a target than most of us. So we have to teach them to be able to defend themselves also. We have what we're participating in now, the New African Nation Building Forums, in which we try to provide, well, all of our speakers aren't as dynamic as Chokwe, but I guess you can understand <laughs> that after having heard his presentation. But we do try to provide good speakers and good topics on issues that we feel are crucial to the development of the community and our survival as a nation in the New African Nation Building Forum. Uh, one of our most fruitful programs at this point in time is the Black Survival Food Co-op. And the food co-op concentrates on meeting one of the needs, um, one of the severe needs of our people, providing good, healthy nutrition. Because in order to struggle, we have to be healthy. And in order for our children to grow and become warriors, they have to be healthy. The institutions in our community are not controlled by us. And we don't have resources to go down and buy rounds or boys. But what we can do is go down and cut all of those sources out and go st straight to the distributor <laughs> of the group. That way, we can provide a lot more of a better quality at uh, much reduced. <coughs> so the food co-op shops every other week and the only requirement is that you work. It's not a shopping service. What you have to do is participate in something that's going on for your own benefit. All we ask is that you shop when it's your turn, even though it means going down at 1.30 in the morning. And we party at 1.30 in the morning with no problem, right? Okay. So we could go shop for food. <laughs> it means distribution. We have to distribute the food among the families once it's brought back to the center. It also means participating in collection. Actually, it's not a whole lot. And I wish I had a box here to show you, but from week to week, I usually give away a lot of the stuff that I have because it's fresh produce to keep from having it go bad. I mean, you get so much. And uh, it's a very worthwhile <coughs> institution that we're trying to develop here. 
And I think we've grown to about 30 families. So if you need any more information about the food co-op or any of the other programs that are going on, you can see me or any other members of uh, the New African People's Organization here at the Center for Black Survival. Now, I said all of that to say this. We need help in carrying on all of these programs. And help means money. So I'd like to ask Bill Lobe to come forward. Owen and uh, let our keynote speaker have a less aggressive voice, man. Then we're going to take some questions and answers. So you might be formulating any kind of questions that uh, may have been provoked um, during the speaking. So we're going to turn the um, maybe some music on. Or Back up right now. We're going to take a few minutes with some questions. And uh, answer period. Anybody have any, any questions? questions? Yes, uh, I, I really enjoyed the conversation you made. I'd like to ask you uh, to elaborate a little bit more uh, uh, a little more about receiving reparations uh, for yeah. your highest leaders. Okay, I think that in order to receive anything, I have to, excuse me, I'm losing my voice. But in order to receive anything, I think it's uh, necessary to, first of all, you have to create a proper demand. And in, in creating the demand, you create the potential for getting what you want. You create people's allegiance to the idea, and you also have to plan for tactical and strategic ways of doing it. I think that in terms of reparations, first of all, we must create a concept of ourselves as a people. See, one of the things is that one of the reasons that we don't really have a demand for reparations, and there's a number of different avenues to assert the demand. I mean, every time you see a black student coming out of a school where he's been improperly educated, <coughs> the problem is not that he was in a segregated school. The problem is that his people don't have reparations and so are not able to build the kind of schools and have the kind of teachers that he needs to go to. There's almost language in U.S. Supreme Court decision which suggests that if anybody had enough sense to come in and raise that, it would give them a great deal of problems dealing with the question. You understand what I'm saying? Right now, for instance, most affirmative action programs are being defeated. And the reason that they're being defeated is because the United States Supreme Court is taking the same rationale that the NAACP used around integration and affirmative action and using it against them. They're saying essentially is that white folks are being discriminated against when you get so many people in the school or when you get so much financial aid and they don't get the same proportion, right? They're actually getting more, but anyway, they still find a way to finagle it, right? And so the situation is, is that they're, they're saying, they say, they also say in these court decisions, well, unless you can show some historic justification for it, then you, we don't think that you should have it, right? Now, the lot they think it's almost like telling people, and each and every day, these same lawyers go in there raising those same issues on that same NAACP mentality. But the reality is that I think that you have the opportunity to raise them in those kind of cases. You have the opportunity to raise it in relationship to what the Japanese have gotten, in relationship to what the Native Americans have really bits and pieces gotten, but they've gotten some. You know, everybody has been understood to be entitled to reparations except us. So the situation is this is that I think that that helps create, in, by awakening our people's consciousness of themselves as a people, the only way they can deny it is to say that we are a people. You aren't entitled to reparations because <coughs> reparations are for people. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So they deny your peopleness and try to destroy your peopleness. So the whole concept of the nation, first of all, is absolutely necessary education in order to support a reparations drive. You can't separate the two, really, okay? Secondly, in my view, and I don't think that we profess to have this all figured out, but the fight for reparations has to be one of the cries for national liberation. And it has to come through things like workers who are unemployed, welfare mothers, rather than fighting to increase the welfare services, they got to go in there on the program that it's not just a question of us trying to get handouts or bailouts. We want to be paid back, period, right? And we want our people to be paid back. And see, welfare mothers as individuals, you know, on an international loss concept, are not just entitled to be paid back as a self but they're entitled to be paid back as a nation. That's why the concept of nation is very important. So I think that we have shown a great degree of energy in mobilizing and with unemployed workers, with workers in factories, with uh, welfare mothers, and I think in order to make the demand real, 
We have to get into those circles and to give them the alternative kind of demand. Finally, let me say this. Obviously, like anything else, it's more than just talk or protest. It comes to a point of action. And I think that the reality is, as I see it, once we have made our people in a popular demand for it, it first of all will get international attention. It will get international attention and properly orchestrated. We can get a number of people to support the thing around the country, world. Even people like Russia, who are really, in my view, imperialists themselves. But right. the reality is, is that they will look for every chance they can to badmouth the United States of America. Mm -hmm. So I think that we have to take advantage of it. We certainly have to get support in our native Africa and in various other spots in the world. United, uh, Europe, uh, U, uh, international pressure has its purposes and it helps. And then finally, what we do is create the ground conditions <coughs> for us to really advance the struggle here and to win them by defeating the empire that has that conquered us. To, be, to, to get right down to it and they end it like on this. Now we will end the fight, wind up getting paid bits and pieces and various different tokens. Might even wind up at some point getting something that they will call reparations, which will be wholly inadequate, right? They'll probably give it to some ancient head Negro and ask them to administrate it. But the only way that you win true and final reparations is that you win the war. Right? You understand what I'm saying? There's a war being waged on us. If you win the war, if you win your national liberation, you get it. Reparations, however, you don't say is unimportant until after you win the war. It is important to raise it now because that's one of the things that get people involved with the national liberation right. movement. But the reality is we got to win the war. We will win the war through the collective powers and protests and energies and dynamics of our people through boycotts, strikes, creative techniques, and by straight out military warfare. And I think that uh, I think a lot of people think that that's, that's not sound talk, but the Vietnamese, which was one of the weakest people in the world, defeated one of the most powerful in the world. It's a question of getting the right kind of pressures on the United States at the right kind of time and applying our pressure at the right spot in order to break their arm, their back, and their neck, right? I think that uh, that's an art that you do in martial arts, right? You take on mighty opponents, and if you can concentrate the energy in the right spot at the right time, you can win. I think our Black Liberation Army is a signal of things to come. I think that if you turn all these youth that are out here shooting each other now into revolutionaries, the United States has a serious problem. Right? That's right. I think that the factories have a serious problem once you get people who work there who don't who believe in what we're doing and who are willing to do a number of things in order to support it. In Detroit, not only did the League of Revolutionary Black Workers march and close down a factory there, you know, on several occasions during the 60s, but also something which is less known is that in the 1970s, two brothers sabotaged a whole factory which closed it down for two or three days, right? So there's all kinds of potential in order to apply the kind of military pressure which must be applied in order to get our rights. And our people must be taught to defend themselves because if Marines or soldiers or anybody marches into your door, then somebody needs to get killed other than you. You know what I'm saying? And I think that that, that has to be a thing. Grenadian people attempted to establish a people's army, but I don't think that they had the time necessary to do it. But we have to do that. We have to have the entrained ability to defend ourselves. If we had that, then we wouldn't be getting raped as much murdered as much, robbed as much, sitting around here waiting for the system to build more jails. And if jails were going to solve the problem, we wouldn't have a problem. There's already more of us in jail than there ever was. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. So things like that. But that would be my question. I think that the, fun, the answer is we got to win the war. All right. Good question. Yeah. Yes, I have a kind of basic question. Um, I know that the Republic of New Africa is trying to or the idea is to have five states in the South of the United States. There's a lot of um, questions that I have around that. But I'm wondering, why would you struggle for five states in the United States as opposed to maybe struggling um, for uh, some kind of liberation for the African continent to be able to possess that part of the world? And also, um, let's say people that are from Central America, like myself, what kind of struggle would you uh, suggest that they have in some place like Panama, where the land is also not theirs, and different parts of the world? Right, I think you ought to be doing the same thing we're trying to do. You ought to be trying to free up Panama, or if, if, you know, in all other nations which are predominantly black. Uh, like, uh, it's interesting, and I'm not trying to be, you know, facetious or anything, but it's interesting <coughs> that people will ask us that question, you know, why we're trying to free land here but we'll never ask it to the Jamaicans, the Barbadians, or other African people who live sure. in the land here. So to the point that I'm trying to make is this, is that we definitely realize Africa's got to be free. Right? Mm -hmm. But what we understand is that the best thing we can do for Africa is turn 30 million people into a force for the freedom of Africa. And see, the way that you turn these people into a force for freedom is that you give them a national liberation struggle and some land to fight for. Mm -hmm. See, because you cannot, first of all, people who are not involved in the revolution, 
and, and, and they're, they're colonizing like us, a very poor supporters of it, no matter how hard we try. Mm -hmm. Why? Let's look at the situation. What can we give them? We can give Africa some money, right? But you have to go to work, you got to make, uh, if you live in Detroit, you got to make about five or six hundred dollars for Ford in order to get five dollars to send to Africa. The situation is that we have to, in other words, create ourselves, if not as a total independent nation, at least as an independent, we, we have to create an independent nation, ultimately. But even to create an independent struggle begins to remove some of the support that we have. Uh, the struggle itself maintains institutions to support some of the people. Therefore, freeing them up from working from the enemy and making money from the imperialists that, that, that exploit Africa. We think that's the fundamental contribution, that the best one we can make for Africa. We don't think that, uh, we think that sending some people there is a good idea. There's no problem with that. You know, we think skilled people should go there. We think they should go there. We think that Africa should send us some help to fight this stuff, you know. But the reality is, is that we don't think that 30 million black people who problem is that they don't have money or don't have the ability to control it and keep it in their communities can really be considered as a primary source for freeing Africa through money. So what we have to free Africa through is by revolution. And those who fight revolutions the best are the ones that's in it, not the ones that's sitting on the sidelines supporting it somewhere else. And so like that's why in order to have a revolution, you got to fight for land. you got to fight for land that you live on. You can't just have a revolution somewhere else and, and call yourself a revolution. So I've been thinking that, so that, that's the point. But we do. Support, but see, our way of supporting Africa is by fighting for our freedom, also by sending material aid. We send as much aid over there as anybody else, and perhaps more, right? We've had people over there doing the elections in Zimbabwe, right? The Black Liberation Army, which fights for the independence of New Africa, was sending uh, Zanu more money, apparently, than all these handkerchief have Negroes that you hear about, right? Because they was liberating money and sending it over there. But at the same time, the way they were able to do that is because they had soldiers and people supporting them who believed in their own freedom, right? right. So uh, this is uh, so this is basically the formula that, that we believe in. But in terms of the five states, let me say this. The five states historically is where the new African nation began here in America. It is where blacks from, or Africans from all over uh, Africa came together in North America and became a nation of people. We are a nation of people. We have a culture. We have an economic uh, you know, uh, identity. We have a political <coughs> identity. We're just as much a, a nation as Jamaicans, <coughs> Barbadians, Panamanians, uh, Guyanians, Panamanians, I'm sorry, uh, and, and, and a number of others. I mean, we have the same. As a matter of fact, our histories are quite similar to all those people, right? OK, same history. And so we also believe that all New Africans and when we, in, in the Western Hemisphere should hook up into alliances and the things of that nature, not only fight for their own freedom, but fight to help the freedom in Africa. So we do believe in all of those things. Uh, so that's why we made that choice. And the five states is a political projection. We think that there will be sufficient numbers of black people to move into those areas for the take the whole five states. Right now, there's already areas which are covered by white minority rule, like the, uh, the Western Bank of Mississippi, which we call the Cush District, which also intersects with the southern part of Arkansas, part of uh, Louisiana, and part of Tennessee has more black people in it than most of the nations that, that the, some of the most black, they have more black people in it than Guyana. They have more black people than Serena in that area. And yet white people who only live in that area, something like one out of every eight or nine, control it totally. So that is a non-self-governing territory, just like any other non-self-governing territory in the Western Hemisphere. So we think it's necessary to move the free it, just like we think it's necessary to move the free Panama or anywhere else where our people are, are colonized. Central America, I think there's a lot of our people there where blacks live in black nations, we think they should fight for freedom. Where they live in nations where they can earnestly unite with other oppressed people, like what I think they should be doing in Guyana, where the Indians are there, the, you know, the East Indians are there and things of that nature. And I think that they should unite with those people in free their nations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When you talk about the aspects of a good leader like confidence, Okay, unity, can you talk, well, not unity, but uh, faith. I think, you know, I was thinking in terms of faith brings about unity, but faith, could you elaborate a little bit on that? What were you talking about? Well, when I talk about faith, I mean, actually I'm talking about confidence in what you're trying to do. I'm talking about a fundamental commitment to believe that you can accomplish it, you know? I think it's necessary to have the belief in that you can accomplish it and faith in your mission that you keep doing it. Uh, I'm not talking about a spooky kind of thing. In other words, I don't want you to be believing in something uh, merely, I think that, you know, what we ask of the spirit, only that it supports the logical thoughts of the mind. You see what I'm saying? 
And what we ask of the emotions, only that they organize around what is positive and what is correct. In other words, we do not ask that a person just believes in something blindly for some kind of spiritual instincts, right? Now, some people do, and as long as they're, they're supporting the right things, we have no problem with it. But the point is, is that the, the situation is we think we'll get our most committed faith through intelligent decisions based upon knowledge of history, based upon knowledge of present circumstance, and based upon resolve in oneself. Uh, and so we're talking about safe faith based upon experience, or at least based upon education, of, which has been won through other people's experience. Right? So this is what we need, okay? Uh, I hope I answered the question. Okay. We're gonna, um, just let that be our last question asked here to our speaker. He did give a very long presentation. You can hear his voice is kind of weak. So we're going to close right now. And the way we like to close all of our nation building forum is an oath, oath to the new African nation. First of all, we would like you all to please stand. As I said, to close our program, we always recite the oath to the new African nation. It's a pledge of commitment to the black nation in North America, which we call New Africa. This is not only a pledge of commitment to black people's nation, but to creating a brighter future for the people of the world. What I would like to do, first of all, is I'll read it through, and then those of you who agree and would like to commit yourself by repeating it after me, you can do so after I've read it. And it goes this way. For the fruition of black power, for the triumph of black nationhood, I pledge to the Republic of New Africa and to the building of a better people and a better world, my total devotion my total resources, and the total power of my mortal life. Those of you who agree, please raise your right fist and repeat after me. For the fruition of black power. For the fruition of black power. For the triumph of black nationhood. For the triumph of black nationhood. I pledge to the Republic of New Africa. I pledge to the Republic of New Africa. And to the building of a better people. And to the building of a better people. And a better world. And a better world. My total devotion. My total devotion. My total resources. My total resources. And the total power of my mortal life. And the total power of my mortal life.